Thanks to EA for sponsoring this video. It's time for a new hero. The kind of person they'll never see coming. Demons, dragons, dark spawn, even the dread wolf. As you can tell, I'm already gearing up for the next Dragon Age, but while I wait on that, might as well get a taste of Thetis now with the Dragon Age cookbook. Dragon Age, the official cookbook Taste of Thetis, takes us on a culinary journey through the epic world of Dragon Age, where combat and magic is as plentiful as the friends you meet along the way. Many thanks to EA for sponsoring this video and sending me a copy of the book. Although this is a sponsored vid, these are my honest thoughts of the cookbook and I'll be going through this the same exact way I do all of the other cookbook critiques. This cookbook is told from the perspective of a Ferelden adventurer named Devon, who traveled all across the land of Thetis, documenting the different food he encountered in their story. Since Devin's mom is a cook in Castle Kuzland, he compiled all of the recipes together in this cookbook and dedicated it to her as a tribute to their shared love of food. The recipe descriptions have many references to the locations, cultures, and characters from the games. I found myself looking up a lot of them and getting nostalgic because the Dragon Age games along with the Mass Effect games were some of my favorite RPGs that I played many, many eons ago. I'm still debating who's the best companion, Morrigan or Garrus. The recipe descriptions are followed up by useful recipe info like yield, cook time, and difficulty. The difficulty of the recipes are rated easy, average, or difficult, but a good 90% of the non-drink recipes are rated average. This might be the book's way of encouraging averagely skilled home cooks by telling us that the recipes in here are not too basic, but also not super complex. But I think it would have been cool to see a more expanded difficulty grading just to break down the average difficulty recipes, since some of them do look harder to make than others. I suggest to read out the whole recipe to get a true scale of how difficult it is. I do really appreciate how transparent the recipes are with cook time. Some cookbooks show the cook time, but then the prep time, like overnight marinating or waiting for the dough to rise, that's sometimes tucked away in the recipe steps. I love how in this cookbook, that stuff is mentioned in parentheses along with the cook time, so you get a real sense of how long it's going to take, and there are no surprises when you're following the recipe. And as you can see, the food photography is next level. The food looks delicious, but I love how super thematic they all feel. All of the different props and weapons, armor, special effects, and background elements really elevate the vibe. Even something as simple and normal sounding as lentil soup feels epic and magical because of all of the set dressings and environmental details, and each photo feels like it's a window into the Dragon Age universe. Well, might as well jump through that window and into the kitchen. I'm gonna make three recipes from the Dragon Age cookbook to see if the food of Thetis tastes as good as it looks. Our first stop is the Hanged Man Tavern where they serve this famous or infamous dish, the Hanged Man's Mystery Meat Stew. Apparently it's a different meat every morning and if you ask too many questions, maybe the mystery meat will be you. In a large pot, heat up one tablespoon of olive oil on medium heat and then fry up one diced up large onion and one clove of minced garlic for two to three minutes until translucent. Our mystery meat is gonna be pork, so add three and a half ounces of pancetta and continue to cook for one to two minutes and add more mystery meat, but this time 21 ounces of ground pork. Lightly brown the meat for five to six minutes, then stir in two tablespoons of tomato paste. Cook briefly before adding a three quarter cup plus two tablespoons of dry red wine to deglaze. Next step is to add 14 ounces of drained canned kidney beans, 10 and a half ounces of canned diced tomatoes, 5.3 ounces of drained canned corn, a coarsely chopped red bell pepper, a minced red chili pepper, two bay leaves, three to four whole allspice berries and one whole clove to the pot. Combine everything well and let it simmer for 20 minutes, stirring occasionally. When the stew has thickened a bit, let's finish it up with some more seasonings. The cookbook didn't state precise measurements for these, so just season to taste. We're adding salt, pepper, paprika, caraway, oregano, a pinch of sugar, and a squeeze of lemon. Let this simmer for another two to three minutes, then remove from the heat. Pick out the clove, allspice, and bay leaves and allow the stew to stand before serving. Garnish with some freshly chopped parsley and enjoy yourself a hearty bowl of the Hanged Man's Mystery Meat Stew. Next, we take a look at a true dwarven delicacy Nug pancakes. In Dragon Age, nugs are underground animals that kind of look like pig bunnies, which makes a lot of sense since apparently they taste like an unholy union of pork and rabbit. Probably more like pork though, since the recipe calls for two pounds of pork shoulder, 
cut it up into five equal pieces and then place them all in a freezer bag. Then in a bowl, combine one tablespoon of salt, a tablespoon of pepper, one and a half teaspoons of turbinado or raw sugar, a teaspoon of ground coriander, half a teaspoon of ground cumin, a teaspoon of hot paprika, a teaspoon of chili powder, and three quarter cups plus one teaspoon of vegetable broth. Add that mixture to the pork and massage it all into the meat and let this marinate in the fridge for at least three hours, but ideally overnight. When ready to cook, heat up a tablespoon of olive oil in a large pot over high heat and brown the pork shoulder on all sides for about three to four minutes. Pour the rest of the marinade from the bag, cover, and pop the pot in the oven at 325 degrees Fahrenheit for three hours. When done, the liquid should barely cover the base of the pot and the meat should pull apart super easy. Place the meat in a bowl and let it cool for five minutes before shredding it up. Once shredded, add the pan drippings along with a one third cup of ready-made barbecue sauce and mix everything well. Then cover with foil to keep warm until ready to serve. Now we've got the nug, let's make the pancakes. In a bowl, mix together one and one third cups of room temp buttermilk and four room temperature eggs. Then in a separate bowl, mix two and a half cups of flour, a pinch of salt, two teaspoons of single acting baking powder and a tablespoon of Italian seasoning. Then add in three tablespoons of melted butter along with a wet mixture and carefully combine everything and let it rest for 15 minutes. After resting, let's make the pancakes by melting about a teaspoon of butter in a large frying pan over high heat and scoop in three to four tablespoons of batter per pancake, making sure to leave room between each. I think my batter ended up being a bit too thick because it's harder to shape into a perfect circle like the book's photo, but I don't think that's too big of a deal. Cook each side for two to three minutes until brown and set aside on a paper towel lined plate and cover with foil while you work on the rest. Let's put everything together by placing some of the meat on a pancake, then another pancake, then meat, then pancake, then meat, then top with a pancake. Or just keep going, why stop there, it's up to you. Skewer your meat tower with some wooden skewers or an arrow and that right there are your nug pancakes. And for a sweet treat, we turn to an Orlesian dessert that's decadent and elegant. We're making a white pudding called Blanc Mange. To start, we soak five sheets of white gelatin in a small bowl of cold water according to package instructions. Then in a pot, combine one cup plus two tablespoons of milk, three and a half ounces of skinless ground almonds, a quarter cup of sugar, and half a vanilla bean. Bring this to a boil, then remove it from the heat, cover, and let the flavors meld together for 20 minutes. Then strain this mixture into a medium bowl and add one cup plus two tablespoons of heavy whipping cream and two to three drops of almond extract. Stir everything well to combine. Squeeze out the gelatin to remove the water and add it to the mixture and stir until the gelatin has dissolved. Mine was not dissolving so I decided to pop it back on the stove on the lowest heat while constantly stirring and eventually the gelatin dissolved. Rinse some dessert molds in cold water, then fill them all out evenly with a mixture. The recipe calls for four molds, but I was able to fill up five, so it all just depends on the size of your molds. Cover the molds with lids or some plastic wrap and refrigerate for at least five hours or ideally overnight. Now for the sauce, let's pour 14 ounces of sour cherries in a small pot, juice and all, then add in one tablespoon of lemon juice, a tablespoon of cornstarch, three tablespoons of sugar, and a pinch of cinnamon. Bring this to a boil over medium heat, and once boiling, reduce the heat to low and simmer for 10 to 15 minutes until the mixture has thickened. Stir as little as possible so you don't break the cherries. Remove from the heat and cool, then place on the blanc mange, and look at that. That looks gorgeous. Can't wait to dig into these. Let's eat, y'all. Starting with our mystery meat stew, the combination of spices for this just smells so nice, and it actually tastes even better. I really like the different texture of the meats with the crumbliness of the ground pork pairing with a meaty chew of the pancetta. The red wine also comes through really strong, but in a good way. It's also got a nice spicy kick from the seasoning and the acidity from the lemon. I actually thought this was going to be on the lighter side in terms of seasoning because I thought a clove of garlic and those tiny bits of clove and allspice weren't going to do much, but no, it's very well seasoned. It's definitely meant to be adjusted to your own taste, but as is, it's pretty dang delicious. Moving on to the Nug Pancakes, this beautiful tower of protein and carbs. Gonna slice into this bad boy and take a bite. Oh, that's a nice savory pancake. The barbecue pork is amazing, but I already knew that heading into this since I couldn't help tasting it when it popped out of the oven. Really well seasoned, very tender and heavy on umami. 
The pancakes were really herby and aromatic, especially with Italian seasoning. I think this is another dish that you can really make your own as well. Maybe add some onions, salsa, and guac for a Tex-Mex variant or some pickled onions and cheese. Whether you want to mix it up or you just want to eat it as is, you'll be having a pretty tasty and very filling meal. Last but not the least, we have the Blanc Mange. I can't get over how pretty this looks. Love the color contrast. First bite and it's delightful. The pudding is so silky smooth and the vanilla and almond flavor combo is beautiful. The cherry sauce has that nice sour kick that contrasts the smoothness of the vanilla pudding. And best of all, it was super easy to put together. I've got five of these blanc manges for now, but believe me, they did not last long since I scarfed them all down almost immediately. So is the Dragon Age cookbook any good? If you're like me and you like cookbooks that are highly thematic with top-notch photos for every recipe, then I think this one's for you. Lots of fun Dragon Age lore to read and interesting and tasty dishes to try out, which will hopefully fill us up and tide us over until Dreadwolf comes out. Can't wait!